biblical teaching who's divisive, not the one who stays on the road. But of course today, they're telling us it's the one who refuses to divert that's the wrong one. I have some very good news, though. As much as I bear witness with what Roger has shared, and I agree with everything he said, very recently, D. James Kennedy, Robert Weber, and Tammy Baker have all changed their theology. <laughs> they no longer believe those things. They've all snuffed it. <laughs> Turn with me, please, to the epistle of Jude. Remember, I'm sorry, 2 Peter. Remember, Jude and 2 Peter are thematically akin to each other. They have the same themes. They both speak of these things in an eschatological framework. Thirdly, they're both written to Jewish believers. That's not to say that Jude and 2 Peter, that doesn't apply to non-Jews, it just means... To understand what it means for us, we have to understand who it was written to. Hebrews, 2 Peter, Jude, and James, four epistles, were all written to Jewish believers in the first century. Now, the content is for everybody, but we have to know what it meant for the people they were writing to, to understand what it means for us. I'll go through the bits you already know very quickly. 2 Peter chapter 2, please. Oh, she's not here. I have the, the copy of the message back there. It's on the table, I think. Can you bring it up? If you don't know, this is my Israeli wife, Pavia. Thank you. Most of you know these bits, so I'll go through it quickly. But false prophets arose among the people, as there will be false teachers among you. Again, Peter uses false teachers and false prophets interchangeably, synonymously, as if they were synonyms. Why does he equate a false teacher with a false prophet? If somebody's doctrine is wrong, if their teaching is wrong, their prophecies will be wrong. Why does somebody like Cindy Jacobs, Benny Hinn, in this country, Gerald Coates, above all Rick Joyner, why do these guys keep predicting things that don't happen in the Lord's name? Why are they false prophets? Because they're false teachers. If somebody's doctrine is wrong, it's inevitable their prophetic predictions will be wrong. Okay. That's why Peter uses the two. But he says they'll come among us, just like Jude, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies. Secretly introduce destructive heresies. Again, it is a term I've explained many times from the original Greek. That term is... Para Sogzusin, most of you know this. Para next to, para Sogzusin. They put truth next to error. The way false teachers and false prophets operate, they put truth next to error. Well, there's some truth in Alpha Courses. Well, there's some truth in purpose driven. Well, God hates the mixture. The Israelis were told not to mix the seed. They could not make a garment of wool and flax. The example we always give is Laodicea, the Church of People's Opinions. Laodiceamai, the rights or the judgments of the people, the laity. If you've been to Laodicea in Turkey, you see that Roman aqueduct brings the hot water from the hot springs, mineral springs from Pamukkala down to Laodicea. You've got the wells with the hot water, the wells with the cold water. But with the two mixed together, the water is lukewarm. And of course, those who say, chew the meat and spit out the bones, don't understand the nature of parasoxusin. Can I say, I'm going to swallow the cold water, spit out the lukewarm? Oh, there's some truth in it. I'm going to swallow the hot water. I use the hot water to make tea, I'm going to spit out the lukewarm. It's a homogeneous solution. It doesn't work that way. These things are package deals. Anything that's true is only there to camouflage what is false. That's the way it works. 
But then he goes on. They will secretly introduce these destructive her uh, heresies, even denying the master who bought them, as it says in Jude. But now look at verse 2. Many will follow their sensuality. The people who follow false teachers and false prophets are people who are governed by senses. Oh, I know it's God. I just feel blessed. <laughs> what about Hebrews 4.12? What about 1 Corinthians, test all things? Oh, no, that's suppressing the spirit. What about the sermon of spirits? Crazy. What does it say? They follow their sensuality. That is why you see so much carnality. You just think the leader of Elam, the same movement here in Indonesia, he was the cheerleader for Toronto and New Zealand. He was having it off with at least 20 women. He was a serial adulterer all during the Toronto. The leader of the Elam movement on the Isle of Man. He's a pedophile having sex with little children in the, in, in, in the nursery during Toronto when he was cheerleading it. That's what these guys, the sensuality. Now, senses are good servants, bad masters. You're governed by sensuality, you've got a problem. We've warned many times, look out for people who are governed by feelings, emotion, and senses, which they can confuse with the Holy Spirit. That is the way Benny Hinn and these guys manipulate people. It is hypnotic induction. They prey on sensuality. People think it's spiritual. They get deceived. They don't test biblically, and they wind up buying the bill of goods. Many will follow, many with their sensuality. Because of them, the way of truth will be maligned. That is the Bible. Verse 3, and in their greed, they will exploit you. Again, just like Jude, there's a financial motive. But they will exploit you with false words. Jesus is the Logos. You know this, N-R-K, Kaiho, Logos. He's the Logos. He's the Word of God incarnate. The Bible is Jesus in published form. Now the case ending is different, but it's the same word. You get case endings in Greek and like you do in Latin and German. But the word here is Pleistios Logos. Pleistios Logos. What does Pleistios Logos sound like? Plastic. It is the Greek word for fabrication. A fabrication of the Word of God. Let's go back to the 1960s. If you wanted to panel your dining room with mahogany, real mahogany, it would be very expensive. That stuff is very, very nice, but it's very, very dear. It cost you quite a few bucks. It's not cheap. But there were some chemists in England and the United States who invented something called Formica. Formica could look just like polished mahogany. In fact, it could look just like a lot of things. And they could even give it properties that Formica didn't have, such as making it fire resistant. Uh, they, the, the, the mahogany, they, they could make it fire resistant. It looked real. But when you get up close, it still wasn't the real thing, even though it looked like it. And it was nice. But then they came up with cheaper ways to make things look like Formica. So now you have an imitation of, a, of an imitation called Masonite. <laughs> if you were going to put an extra cupboard in the kitchen, you could get away with plywood and plasterboard. No, you can get away with plywood and sheetrock. Sheet rock. Sheetrock looks like plasterboard, but it isn't. Plywood looks like lumber, but it isn't. It's cheap. It's garbage. Anybody can be a karate expert. You can break the thing in half. It's okay for an extra linen cabinet, but you can't build a house with plywood and sheetrock and expect it to be structurally solid. It's garbage. It's imitation. I look at this microphone. This microphone, due to the miracles of polymer chemistry, has components which are metallic and plastic. 
The plastic components made of polymers look metallic. You can't tell the difference. And once again, you can even give the metallic components properties, I'm sorry, the uh, plastic components properties the metallic doesn't have. They actually have certain plastics that are almost as strong as steel. There are ceramic materials that are stronger than steel. You can do all kinds of things with polymer chemistry. And you can all kinds of things be done with monkey tricks with the word of God. A Pleistios Logos. Now again, Peter puts this in an eschatological framework. I have a copy here of Rick Warren's Bible of Choice, The Message. NRK Kaiho Logos, in the beginning was the word. Verse 14 of John 1. And the word became flesh, the logos became sarx, and dwelt among us. In Greek, that word dwelt is kataskeno. It is a Greek, not so much translation, but transliteration of the Hebrew mishkan. Kataskeno Mishkan. In other words, the same Shekinah, the same divine presence in the Holy Ark in the Old Testament, would become indwelt bodily in the Lord Jesus. It kataskenoed against us. It Mishkan, it tabernacled among us. That's what it says. That's what the Logo says. That is what the eternal word of God says. I'm going to read you from the message, John 1.14. And the word became flesh and moved into our neighborhood. <laughs> this is Rick Warren's Bible of Choice. Let me begin at the beginning. What Rick Warren does is something called conscientiousization. It's a new hermeneutic invented by liberation theologians, left-wing Roman Catholics in Latin America in the 1960s, like Bonino and Sobrino. Habakkuk took his stand on the watchtower, and he saw what was coming from the perspective of God's word. Conscientization is the opposite. You begin with your perspective and interpret the Bible from where you stand. So instead of looking at social injustice from what God says about it, and God, there's over 300 verses in the Bible, both testaments, denouncing social injustice. But instead of seeing social injustice from God's perspective, you look at God's word from the perspective of social injustice. <laughs> so they wind up concluding that the exodus of the Jews, because it was a national political liberation, that is the central theme of scripture, not the death, resurrection, and return of Christ. <laughs> this is conscientiousization. It requires something called proof texting. Proof texting. Most of you know when you take out of the Bible that which it says, that is called exegesis. When you read something into the Bible that it doesn't say, that is called error, but it's asegesis. Okay. When you deal with what the Bible says, that is called induction. When you give your opinion about what it means, even though it doesn't say it, that is called deduction. Deductive. Calvinism is based on deductions, people's opinions. There's nothing in the Bible that says God only made two covenants, one with Abraham and one with uh, Adam. That's, that, that's their opinion. And a crazy opinion at that. What they do is, what Rick Warren does is this. Proof text. You already have your own opinion, and then you try to find the verse or passage to justify it. Now, if you can't find it in the original Greek and Hebrew, 
Go to a translation. If you can't find it in a translation, go to a paraphrase. If you can't find it in a paraphrase, go to the message. <laughs> get yourself a plastic Bible. If the real one doesn't say what you want it to say, get a plastic one. That'll do the trick. You can always give the synthetic properties the original doesn't have, just like with Formica, just like with polymers. It's the same word. That's where we get the word. As you can see, I like biblical languages. When I first got saved on the streets of New York, I could say exactly two things, wow and far out. <laughs> After I'd been saved only a few days, my vocabulary doubled. I could say, thank you, Jesus, and praise the Lord, and tripled. <laughs> Let's understand this, the plastic Bible. Turn with me, please, to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8, verse 8. Nehemiah 8, 8, the Jews returned from Babylon minus something they went with, specifically their native tongue. There was no Septuagint yet in Greek, no Targums yet in Aramaic. Only the Levites and old people still knew Hebrew. They had a problem. Nehemiah, Ezra, they were from the Katav tradition. They were Sophrine, they were scribes. And verse 8 of Nehemiah 8, they read from the book, from the law of God, the Megillah Torah, the Torah scroll, translating or explaining to give the sense so they understood the meaning. Translating and explaining so to give the people the sense so they understood the reading. There's two words here. And even though my wife's a math teacher, she did a degree in Israel in Biblical Hebrew and Judaism, Jewish history, so I better be careful because she'll call me on it because she's a very rude woman. <laughs> Look at that verse again. They read from the book from the law of God translating. That word translating is interesting. Mikra. Now in modern Hebrew, that's just a general word for scripture. They gave the mikra so the people would understand the sense of the meaning. That term is sechel. Sechel is a Hebrew term for like a wise, modern Hebrew, like a wise brain, like Yiddish a cup is in Yiddish, a sechel, sechel Yehudi is a smart Jewish guy, something like that. Okay. It's a kind of wisdom. This is the only verse in the Bible, the only verse that deals with the subject of translation, inductively. People have tried to say other verses deal with it, especially the King James only people and the Ruckmanites, but this is the only verse in the entire Bible dealing with the subject of translation. Two things, Mikra and Secha. They read from the book of the law, translating, to give the sense of the reading. You need a practical kind of wisdom to convey the author's intent of the original. <laughs> it is like computer video graphics, it is like medical science, it is like dentistry, it is like architectural engineering. Translation is both an art and a science. It is both an art and a science. It's not exact. There will always be a subjective element involved in translating from one language to another. If you come to my house, you can hear spoken variously between us all, Spanish, French, English, Hebrew, Romanian, and if somebody loses their temper, Yiddish. <laughs> if my wife's parents are visiting Russian and a few other things. Well, there's no one way to translate it. 
Let's look at our own country, Great Britain. When William the Conqueror invaded French-speaking Vikings, they bought a lot of French words. One was interage, encolage. And the old French, correct me if I'm wrong, but I know I'm not. In the old French, it meant to put bravery into somebody. That's literally what it meant, to put bravery into somebody. Okay, in old French. Now today I could say, I would really encourage you to go to the Virgin Islands instead of to Puerto Rico for your holidays. It takes no more bravery to get on a plane and go to the Virgin Islands than it does to go to Puerto Rico. But when William the Conqueror writes a letter to one of his princes and he says, I would encourage you to attack Harold at Hastings at dawn, I couldn't say encourage. I would have to say embolden. I'd have to embolden you. It requires sechel to give the mikra. <laughs> it requires sechel to give the mikra. These words change. Get a copy of, Tin, of uh, Wycliffe's Bible if you've ever seen one. It's old. <laughs> it's like Beowulf. It's like older than the Canterbury Tales. That kind of English. Chaucer, pre-Chaucer. You can't read it. Unless you have a degree in English literature, you can't read it. Most of us would struggle with Shakespeare, unless you have a degree in English literature. But we forget about it. Well, ancient Hebrew and modern Hebrew, it's the same. I know educated Israelis, educated Israelis, who prefer to read the Psalms in English or French, because the poetic language is so difficult. It's just not that simple. Unless you have a degree in Hebrew, like my wife does. I married a concordance. <laughs> I'm too lazy to look stuff up. She's also a math teacher. I wish she'd know how to balance the checkbook. But anyways. <laughs> in the Song of Solomon it says, Ani le do di ve do di li. I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. In modern Hebrew, I am my uncle's, and my uncle is mine. Same words. It's not that easy. You want to give the mikra, but it requires sekhar. It's not cut and dry. It is as much an art as it is a science. Now notice one thing this verse does tell us. The one thing this verse tells us is that the priority is on the original meaning of the original language, in the original autographs. That is the one thing the Bible says, is that the priority of the original autographs. That's it. Everything else has to try to be true to that. We have people called Ruckmanites. Now, I have a great regard for the underlying manuscripts of the King James Bible, simply because I have such a high regard for people like Coverdale and William Tyndale. People paid with their lives to give us the manuscripts that underlie that Bible. And I love it for its prose. God has used that Bible tremendously. But there are heretics in the States, like Peter Ruckman, on his third marriage. And he said on his tape, trying to defend marriage, remarriage, serial remarriage, at no time will I appeal to the original Greek and Hebrew for the simple reason that anyone who deviates from the King James will go into error. <laughs> he actually says that additions to the 1611 King James Bible, not found in the original Greek and Hebrew, were further revelation. This is completely heretical. Deuteronomy chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Matthew chapter 15, Revelation chapter 22. Do not add. Proverbs 30. He says it's further revelation. To take post-Elizabethan English, a translation of a translation, and lift that above the originals is crazy. 
crazy. Absolutely crazy. While I have a high view of Coverdale and Tyndale, read Sir Winston Churchill's book on the history of the English-speaking people, or read Toynbee, or read any serious historian looked at King James. Most agree he was a homosexual. Most of them say that. Everybody agrees he was corrupt, and everybody knows he killed born-again Christians. Who authorized the authorized version? A pedophile king who killed Christians? He was the son of Mary, Queen of Scots. She butchered Christians. He quotes the Apocrypha as canon. He has all this other stuff, the Feast of the Annunciation of the Virgin Mary, the Feast of All Saints. This is all in the 1611 Bible. That is not to fault the underlying manuscripts of Tyndale. These people did the best they could under impossible circumstances. Tyndale was pursued relentlessly by Cardinal Wolsey and Henry VIII. They finally killed him in Belgium. They did the best they could under impossible circumstances. But I've had some people try to say, only the King James has been used to bring revival. There was revival in England hundreds of years before the King James, before the Reformation, under the Lollards, under Wycliffe. That was the translation from the Vulgate. A bad translation. The Vulgate is a hatchet job. It influenced Calvin. It's the Roman Catholic Bible from Jerome. Yet God used it. What about the languages and cultures that didn't have English as a language? They never had a revival? <laughs> it's in a stupid statement. But it gets even more absurd. I was saved in the Jesus movement among the hippies. Our Bible was mainly the Revised Standard. Not my own Bible of choice, but it wasn't the King James. It's a ridiculous statement to say only revival has come from the King James. That's nonsense. I once had somebody who was a King James only fanatic. To them, the test of orthodoxy was not what you believed, but which Bible you read. <laughs> and I said, can you read this psalm? And he read, If I forget the old Jerusalem and my right hand forget its cunning. I said, that's not it. It just says, May I forget my right hand. Jehovah will bring salvation with his right hand. It's a figure of Christ. There's no idea of cunning. Uh, there's no such idea. In the, it's wrong. Where do you get Easter? All four Gospels plus 1 Corinthians say that Jesus rose from the dead on Yom Rishon of Hagmatzot, the Hebrew feast of first fruit. Admit it, the King James is wrong in certain places. It calls the Holy Spirit an it. Like the Jehovah's Witnesses in one. It's a mistake. It's got mistakes. The priority is the original. Now, these people, of course, the biggest fraud in the world is Gail Ripplinger. That one's a complete fraud. How can you say which manuscript most accurately translates an original language if you don't know the original language yourself? She can't even read Greek. Her degree is in home economics. If I wanted to read a treatise on detergent, <laughs> I might pay attention to her. But when she makes, misrepresents herself as an expert in biblical languages, she's a fraud. When Dr. Wayne House interviewed her, she admitted she couldn't even read Greek. But let's begin. There are those who've said, we really have to be accurate. Those who emphasize the science of translation more than the art. There are... Those who follow formal equivalents. This would include literal Bibles, like Young's Literal or Wust. The problem with those Bibles is this. In English, they are too literal. You can't read them. They're word by word, but you can't read them. There are particles of speech, there are differences in syntax, sentence construction in Greek and Hebrew that don't exist in English. Now, it's a good study aid for people who don't know Greek and Hebrew, but that's all. You can't read it, you can't preach from it, you can't witness from it, it's too awkward. Understandability was everything. 
We are supposed to give the mikra, the sense of the meaning. I used to live in East London. Did evangelism in East London. Cockneys. Beverly, Beverly, I say unto thee, ye must be born again. You're right, not a night. <laughs> I did evangelism in a council estate in Liverpool called Speak. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, ye must be born again. Are you all right, mate? You made up. <laughs> Don't think you're nuts. <laughs> so there are people who then say, well, look, we have to be realistic. Let's go with an informal equivalence. Literalist, Holman's, New English Virgin, New American Standard Version. They will interpolate things to make the text readable without deviating from the original meaning, but they will interpolate things not found in the original just so we can read it. New American Standard, New English is a good one, King James is another one. But then there are those who come along and say, well, wait a minute now. Put the red line. We don't want people to misunderstand the scripture. These guys do something interesting. They Annotate. The Roman Catholic Church had a problem. When Gabriel tells Mary, you'll be the mother of the Messiah who will save his people from their sin, the first words out of her mouth is, my soul rejoices in God my Savior. Mary said she needs to be saved from sin. The Catholic Church says she didn't. What are we going to do? You can see why the Bible is on the index of banned books for centuries by the Roman Church. Who's right, Mary or the Pope? Well, we'll put notes in the margin. This is the Jerusalem Bible. You will read the text through the prism of the notes in the margin written by their Roman Catholic theologians, Jesuits usually, or Dominicans. But it was not only the Catholics who did this. Dispensationalists did this with Schofield's Bible. You will read the text through the prism of the notes in the margin even though they really don't change too much the text itself. It borders on adding to the Word of God in my own personal view. But then there is what we call not formal or informal equivalents. There are those who come along and say, look, we have to really make sure the people can understand every possible meaning of the original. So we will amplify it. Maybe you've seen an amplified Bible. It is punctuated with things in brackets and parentheses trying to convey every possible nuance of the original Greek and Hebrew for people who don't know Greek and Hebrew. Again, a good study aid, but you can't read it you can't preach from it, you can't witness from it, it's just over-punctuated with things in brackets. It has its value, but you couldn't read it. But then it gets interesting. The red line, the green line, we're still safe. The further you go away from the original autographs, the further you go away from the green, something happens. You begin giving less scope to translation and more scope to interpretation. It's not what it actually says, but the way somebody interprets what it says. So they come up with something called dynamic. That's correct. 
they come up with something which is a dynamic equivalent. Thought by thought. Now, I don't like dynamic equivalents. The problem is, I think NIV is that. The problem is, even though Brother Jacob doesn't like dynamic equivalence, God does not seem to have the same problem. The Vulgate is a bad dynamic equivalent, and Wycliffe got his Bible from it. It was the first time there was a revival in England, (laughs) long before the Reformation. More importantly than that, though, is that with the partial exception of Matthew, When the New Testament quotes the Old, it doesn't follow the Hebrew Masoretic. It normally follows the Septuagint. And the Septuagint is dynamic equivalence. That's supposed to be Septuagint. That's the generally agreed symbol, 70. I once had a King James only person so angry, he tried to convince me that the that the Septuagint, which was produced about 160 years before Christ in Alexandria, uh, was an early forgery by the early church in the third century. That's how nuts he was. No, I don't like dynamic equivalence, but what do I do with the fact that the apostles used it? Remember, we only have 420 manuscripts of Caesar's conquest. We have over 10,000 manuscript fragments of the Gospels alone. The body of manuscript evidence supporting the Gospel and the historicity and their uniformity is massive compared to any other body of literature that we have from the ancient Greco Roman world or any other civilization. It's massive. And in every one of them, the Septuagint is what's normally quoted when it quotes the old, in the formula citations. But then we go further. The story I've told a number of times was some Bible translators, missionaries in equatorial Africa, to a tribal culture that had no written language, and they were hundreds of miles from Mount Kilimanjaro, which was the nearest place where there was snow. They had no written language, and they never saw snow. They didn't know what it was. Most of the people had never been more, or had any reason to go more, than 15, 20 miles from where they lived. So what do we do with Isaiah 118? Your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. They translated it, your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as coconuts. Paraphrased. You can't deny these people the gospel because they don't have a written language and you can't say, well, we can't translate the Bible because they never saw snow. They showed them pictures of snow and they took some of the tribal chiefs on an airplane and showed them Mount Kilimanjaro and then they came back and explained it to their own people. But initially, when they were just evangelizing in that and trying to give them the gospel, they used coconut. What do you do with a little kid who's learning how to read? See Spot, see Jane run, see Puff, see Puff run. What do you do with little kids? You give them a children's Bible. You give them a paraphrase until they're old enough to read. Generally, I do not like paraphrases. But I have to accept the fact that in certain missiological situations, and with children, there is a practical need for it as a temporary provision until the people become literate enough to read a proper translation. When I see somebody saved five years, ten years, reading the good news, I think it makes me want to pull what hair out I have left. Why don't you get a proper Bible? You're not an ignoramus. You know how to read. 
What are you reading something like that for? I don't mind a little kid with the children's Bible store. I don't mind that. As a temporary provision. But that's all. But then we get into really dangerous turf. If I had a black pen, I'd use it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Isn't she a nice lady? When you cross the green line, all right, I accept that. When you cross the red line, I accept that. But now you're talking about the black line. <laughs> now we have redacted translations. Not just paraphrases, edited Bibles. I know the guy, I've known him a long time. I compared the Greek text of Ephesians 5 with David Stern's Ephesians 5 from his Jewish New Testament. It is worse than a paraphrase. That thing might be a commentary of some description, but if you want a commentary, get Edersheim or read Arnold Fruchtenbaum. The Jewish New Testament is off the wall. First of all, I didn't know there was any other kind of New Testament other than the one the apostles wrote and they were all Jewish, except Luke who converted to Judaism. There is something happening in the church where because something comes in the name of Messianic or Israel, people think it must be right, it must be true. There are as many kooks in the Messianic movement as there are in any other faction of the body of Christ. We have Neo-Galatians trying to rebuild the wall of partition that Christ died to break down. We have people who are lifting up Jewishness instead of Jesusness, particularly ones who don't know anything about Judaism. <laughs> We've got rabbis who are not rabbis who don't even know the Hebrew language. The Messianic movement is loaded with kooks. Now there is serious Messianic scholarship and scholars and books. And writers. You can go all the way back to David Barron. That's good. You can read Arnold Fruchtenbaum. That's good. You can read Edersheim. There's, there's stuff worth reading. I think everybody should understand the Jewish background of the scriptures. Everybody. But most of what's in the Messianic movement today is charismania mixed with Yiddishkeit. Mixed with Ashkenazi diasporic Jewish culture. It is a big nonsense. The Jewish New Testament is a ridiculous Bible. But the first ones to do this were the Jehovah's Witnesses. There is no indefinite article in the Greek language. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. There's no indefinite article. Given the fact that 99.9% .9 of them are generally uneducated, they must be brilliant people. How can people who are uneducated invent something called <laughs> the future? <laughs> they invented they in, they, in, they invented a tense in the Greek language that doesn't exist. <laughs> future perfect. They invented a text in the Greek language that doesn't exist. The Jehovah's Witnesses. Those people are so deceived. You know, I've even led Muslims to Christ by God's grace. Orthodox Jews have led to Christ. All kinds of people. But Jehovah's Witnesses, they got to be... <laughs> I haven't even led one Jehovah's Witness to Christ. Now, I've known some have gotten saved and God blessed them. It's so, the, the bondage, and, and, it's, and it's a, what they believe is absurd. Redacted Bibles. Well, what could be worse than a redacted Bible? 
Well, I'll tell you. What's worse than a redacted Bible is an inclusive translation. The Reader's Digest published the first major one. The main one sold in bookshops is the Century Bible. The Century Bible. We have to include everybody. Our father and our mother who aren't in heaven. So the feminists won't be upset. Romans 1, homosexuality is unnatural. And they gave up the love of the man for that which is unnatural, the love of the woman. Take that out. <laughs> get rid of Romans 1, get rid of Deuteronomy. You, know, you can't have, you have to include everybody. This is called inclusivism. I thought that was it. We've gone beyond the inclusive. Now we've come to the message from hell. <laughs> A Jehovah's Witness would not have the audacity to pull a stunt like that. A Jehovah's Witness wouldn't. Now you got a problem. Now we have the Logos, Plastios, the Plastios Logos. The word order doesn't matter in Greek because of the case endings. Nominative, dative, genitive, accusative. The Plastios Logos. It looks like a Bible. It seems to read like a Bible. But it's not a Bible. It looks like mahogany. It polishes like mahogany. But I got it on sale at Asda, $14.98 a sheet. It's for Micah. It looks metallic. It's even heat resistant. But it's plastic. You go to W.H. Smith's and they take one off the shelf in the section where there's Bibles. What does it say? The Holy Bible. It's called the Holy Bible. It looks like a Bible. And it has 66 books. Same as your Bible. And the books are in the same order from Genesis to Revelation. Same name, Holy Bible. Same number of books. Same name of the books. It looks like the Bible. But it's not. <coughs> it is so deviated from the original autographs, it is a different book with a different message. It is not the message, it is the message from hell. <coughs> what could be worse? I thought that was it. I couldn't imagine anything being worse. Now, I've seen people do this verbally. But to actually do it in print? Rodney Brown did it verbally. Look to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Remember the clowning in tongues video? With Copeland and Rodney Brown? Copeland said, uh, Rodney Brown says, don't try to judge this, don't try to understand it. He says, the natural mind does not understand the things of the spirit. That's all he said. It's not biblical to try to understand it. Just get down on the floor and behave like you're in drunken hysterics. Look at verse 14 of second, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. But a natural man, in Greek, the word is anthropon. 
Man, not mind. Rodney Brown changes the word man to mind. The natural mind does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness to him. He cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised or discerned, the word in Greek, diakrino, investigated and discerned. Diakrino is the biblical word for <coughs> discern. It's the modern Greek word for investigate. <coughs> in other words, unsaved people, people who are not born again, people who do not have the Spirit of God, cannot discern things spiritually because they can't discern them biblically. Verse 15, but he who is spiritual, a believer, as opposed to a natural man, diacrinos, appraises, discerns, judges all things. Yet he himself is appraised by no man. An unsaved person cannot discern the things of the Spirit, but somebody who is spiritual, who is saved, who is born again, has the Spirit of God, can and does. But unsaved people can't figure him out. That's what it says. That's the original meaning of the original Greek. Rodney Brown changes one word. He changes man to mind and gives it a completely different meaning. And he disconnects verse 14 from verse 15. I've seen people do this verbally. But to actually put it in print? It's on his website. And it's in his book. I couldn't believe this. If Rodney Howard Brown takes the cake, Rick Warren walks off with the whole bakery. <laughs> I couldn't believe it! Turn with me in conclusion, please, to the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 6. Roger mentioned this briefly without going into the textual issues. And so when they'd come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? Notice the kingdom is restored to Israel, never the church. The entire purpose-driven agenda is very much rooted in replacement theology, and it is following a dominionist eschatology. For he said to them, It's not for you to know the times or epics the Father has fixed with his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the remotest parts of the earth. These were Jews. What they were saying to Jesus is, we know you're the suffering servant, Ben Ephraim from Isaiah 52 and 53. But when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? To be the Messiah, you must restore the kingdom to Israel. To be the Messiah, you must restore the lineage of David. In other words, if there's no millennial reign of Christ, he's not Christ. If Yeshua is not the Mashiach, Jesus is not the Christ. He must fulfill all the Old Testament prophecies. Most of you know he's only fulfilled the suffering servant prophecies. In his first coming, he came as Hamashiach ben Yosef, not Hamashiach ben David. In his first coming, he comes in the character of Joseph, a suffering servant. In his second coming, in the character of David, to set up the Messianic kingdom. There must be a millennial reign of Christ. Forget all this amillennial, postmillennial hogwash. It's an invention of incipient Roman Catholicism. After Constantine pseudo-Christianized the Roman Empire, Augustine had to spiritualize the millennium. But let's look. Now, implicitly, he confirmed it would happen. He didn't say, it's not going to happen. The kingdom would be restored to Israel, but your concern is evangelism. Now he said this on the Mount of Olives. We were just there a few days ago. One or two of you were with me. Turn with me please back to Matthew 24. Verse 3. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives the disciples came to him. Same location now. Same geographical location. They came to him privately, tell us what will these things be, what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age. First words out of his mouth, let no one deceive you. And he gives an intricate orchestrated litany of things to look out for. Watch out for this, 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 this. 
Lord, when are you coming? What will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Don't be deceived. Watch out for this, 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 this. Lord, when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? That's the Father's business when that's going to happen. You worry about evangelism. Two different questions asked on the same mountain, okay? Two different questions asked on the same mountain. I didn't have a word for this. Somebody gave me the term, so I'll use it because it seems to fit translocation. Translocation. In your mind's eye, bring up the New Testament, the Gospels, the New Testament rather, on a computer screen. Bring it up on a computer screen and take your mouse. Highlight Acts chapter 1, verse 6, and delete it. Then go to Matthew 24, scroll up to Matthew 24, highlight verse 3, and do a cut and paste. <laughs> so, where Acts 1, 6 used to be, now you have Matthew 24, verse 3. So now it becomes, Lord, what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? That's not for you to know about. You shall receive dunamis, power when the Spirit comes and be my witnesses. <laughs> Highlight and delete, cut and paste. He's replacing one verse with another. One book from another. One context from another. He's replacing one question with another. Therefore, he's giving the diametric opposite answer. Read my lips. He translocated the verses. Highlight and delete Acts 1 6. Highlight Matthew 24, verse 3, and do a cut and paste. Put verse 3 from Matthew 24, where verse 6 from Acts 1 used to be. That is what Rick Warren did. That man is from hell. You hear what I said? That man is an agent of Lucifer. He is sent from hell. In his own backyard in California, I said and I stand by it, I will debate him anytime, any place, as long as it's in front of a video camera and open to the public. That man is from hell. Nobody ever did this before. Actually shifting the order of verses in order to mislead God's people into something that is diametrically opposed to what it actually says. A plastic Bible? A plastic Bible? This is a plastic Bible at its worst. It's cheap plastic. Rick Warren is actually worse than this. I guess he uses this because he couldn't find anything further away from the originals. What you have is a plastic Bible. This is what Peter said would happen in the last days. And this is what you've got. But you know what scares me the most? Tens of thousands of pastors are reading it. Tens of thousands of pastors are teaching it. Those who should be shepherding the flock and protecting them from the wolves are feeding them to the wolves. Forget about Greek and Hebrew. Can't they read English? That's not even what it says in English. This is beyond belief. This is from hell. This is a degree of apostasy that's unfathomable. It's absurd. It's ludicrous. It's worse than the Jehovah's Witnesses. Even the Jehovah's Witnesses have never pulled a stunt like this. Translocation. And then he puts it in print. He publishes it. Puts it on his website. In black and white. And pastors can't say, wait a minute. 
Oh boy. It's like it says in Micah, in the last days, look out for the aluf, look out for the leader, look out for the general. The aluf is the modern Hebrew word for a general, but it's the steer of a herd that the others follow. (laughs) He's leading you right into a slaughterhouse. It's leading you right into a slaughterhouse. If you're in a church that's reading this, you got a big problem. If you're in a church that's purpose-driven, you're in a church that's purpose-drivel. Sheep are led, not driven. It's marketing, it's psychology, it's new age, it's ecumenism, it's deception. But above all, it's plastic. It's not even real. Who wants Masonite when you can have mahogany? God bless.